have no read it because if you, you should read the code and then you'll know what it does. See? Easy. Okay. So uh, what I did, I, I have a description. So that's basically all you need, right? So uh, the web sub is this great protocol that has uh, the uh, grand distinction of having been renamed after people had already forgotten about it. Uh, which is basically the best possible choice for your protocol is to get to the point where it's really popular and everyone's implemented it and then have it kind of fade from memory a little bit because it's all, all some more cool stuff being done with it and then standardize it under a different standards body and change its name because that way everyone will always know what you're talking about when you stay. Yeah, I think that's a good plan. So this, this used to be called Pubs Up Hub Up. It was a Google thing. Um, now it's called WebSub because the W3C felt like changing the name. I don't know. Um, anyway, it's still the de facto standard way of getting notifications about feeds on the web. Uh, it's not the best protocol ever, but it's not bad. And then they've extended it so you can get notified about like literally any resource. So then there's this thing called Lafayette Fest that I talked about last month that's uh, the addressable distributed storage network system for arbitrary blobs of static content, which sounds great. And then what if the content is a, a, a thing you want to subscribe to and you want to That's basically what this project is about. Getting, so you can get pings of updates from the system. Um, so the way this is built, it lays over the whole system. So normally with WebSub you have like some hub that your site your website advertises, and then whenever you make an update, you tell the hub, hey, I updated, and then it checks what you updated, and it tells all your subscribers, hey, here's the new content. Uh, this doesn't work like that at all. Um, instead, it just lays over the entire UGLFS network, specifically the mutable, the commonly used mutable reference points for IPNS and DNS. Uh, and then anything that's being subscribed to, it just, it currently pulls um, DNS you have to pull, but pulling DNS is really, really cheap because the thing is just a giant cache tree. Uh, so if it didn't change, then the DNS requests are, are very, very cheap. They're basically the cheapest thing you can do because you're probably asking a local DNS server if you're not your misconfigured uh, that has already cached your request and knows about the TTLs and everything. So you don't have to, you can just like spam it and you're only using up resources on your local cache anyway, and when the when it's time to refresh, it'll do the invalidation in the normal way, and you don't have to worry about that at all. For IPNS, there's going to be a notification system that I could use, but it's currently also pulling that because it's unpopular enough that it didn't matter for my implementation at the moment. So it just lays over the whole thing. You can subscribe to any resource on the entire network, and then it'll notify you when it sees a change. And then it only pulls things that anyone can subscribe to. Uh, okay, code. That's what I hear. Huh, this is, I don't think that they, they used to only throw the text and leave it the, the, the same. This is a very stupid foot for me. I don't like it. Yeah. Okay. Take in requests and say, yeah, yeah, go. You can subscribe to that. So 
main, start web server. That's good. We'll also connect to Redis, because obviously we're going to need Redis. We can write a program for Redis. We got some numbers. Um, so one of the changes in uh, Puzzle Fellow 0.4, which has been incorporated into the web sub spec, is the idea of a lease. So when you subscribe, you're not subscribing until you unsubscribe. You're subscribing for some number of seconds, uh, and then your subscription expires, and you have to subscribe again. Uh, this is basically to prevent people from writing test scripts to test their subscriber, subscribing once, never unsubscribing, and leaving public servers with thousands and thousands and thousands of useless entries in their database. That's basically the whole point of that change, because Google released a public server with no way for things to expire, and then suddenly realized, oh no, our database is full of garbage. Uh, so they, that, that, so that's what this is, and then the, the hub is allowed to say how long this could be, because people could also just say, like, make it a billion years, and then that would be the same problem again. So the hub can say, no, 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 this is the maximum amount of time. So I have minimum amount of time and maximum amount of time and default amount of time. So if you don't tell me how long you want, I give you this. If you do tell me how long you want, but it's too short, I give you this. Uh, and this is the mix. That's basically, I'm just defining some constants. I set up my app. There's only one app. I don't need a router because every single request to this web server is a subscription request. There are no other kinds of requests because that's the only thing this app does. So there's no router, there's no paths. It's just all requests going to this app. Um, I set up an error handler up at the top that just returns uh, 400 with the string content of the error for everything because uh, that's easy and every error I throw in here is something that's supposed to go back to the user anyway. That's how it's designed. So that way I don't have to explicitly be returning all over the place. Yeah. And then I use that almost right away because almost all the logic in this file is validations because it's the public interface part. So I'm like, OK, if it's not a post, then be like, no, it has to be a post. Because the only thing that I do is take subscription requests, spec says subscription requests are posts, so it has to be a post. So I guess you could pretend that that's a router, where I'm routing between works and has an error message, but like, eh, I, I treat it as validation on the input request. Uh, and then uh, I slurp all the frames out, so this is just some fancy stuff with like, you can have file uploads in an HTTP request, and they can be big, and they have to decide if they're temp files or not, but there's no reason you would ever send me one, so I just null them out, right? Basic stuff like that, I just parse the whole request into those params here. Uh, and then I can look up stuff in the frames, like what is the hub mode? Uh, hub mode is either subscribe or unsubscribe. You're either subscribing or you're unsubscribing. If you're trying to do anything else, then, then no. I don't know what that means. So this, uh, this question mark, question mark here takes any uh, possibly nullable value and uh, instead turns it into an error in the context that I'm in. So this unknown hub mode screen here We'll get bubbled up to that handler at the top, and we'll get 400 with that message. So that's going to be the same all the way through here, right? All my errors are just strings, because I didn't really, I could make like a type for my errors, which normally you would do, but since the only thing I ever do with these errors is catch them right away, six lines above, and return them into 400, then there's, there's no point doing that. So they're all just strings. Um, so yeah, so I take the two things, I turn them into a type, representing the mode. Um, the topic in WebSub is like the, URI that you're subscribing to. Um, so I try and parse that, and if it can't be parsed as the URI at all, then I'm just like, I don't know what you sent me, but it was obviously garbage. Call back, same thing as the URI where I'm going to send back to you the updates, right? So all this stuff is like really just going through and validating the basic stuff, right? You have to be either HTTP or HTTPS because it was something else than like for the call, because uh, my callback sender uses an HTTP library. So if you ask me to send like updates to some other protocol, I don't speak that, so I just say no. Um, now, if you have a query string or a fragment, then I ban you, basically because neither of those are meaningful in the IPFS context. And so if you have them, you might be expecting that they would do something, but they won't. They'll just be ignored. So instead of having you be really confused, I just give you an error if you try to do that. Because you probably didn't mean to do that. Uh, and I get the host name extracted here. So yeah, get the host name and I regularize it a little bit. And then there's one last thing where I say, oh yeah, everything has to either be, has to either have no host name 
and just start with slash IBNS slash. So you've sent me an actual uh, IBFS IBNS path, in which case I don't have to do any magic. This is like a case that I don't actually expect to happen. I just allow it because it's a reasonable, like if someone knew about this hub specifically and was coding applications specifically where they wanted web callbacks for IPFS changes, then like this would be a reasonable thing to do. But if you're just using like something you find on the web that happens to support WebSub, then obviously they won't do that because that's only will ever work with this hub. But I support it anyway, why not? Otherwise, I transform the HTTP URL that I assume you sent me. Actually, I just ignore the scheme entirely. I just say, I just turn it into an IPFS name in the most obvious way, because I'm like, that's probably what you meant, and we'll find out in a second if it doesn't make any sense, and then if it doesn't have to be error again. So I just transform everything into an IPFS name. Either it already is one, or I extract the reasonable case from what you've got. And this is all just like, yeah, make my lease the thing. If I have a secret, then do that. And then I just push the whole thing into rest. By the time I get to this point, I'm like, okay, all the parameters are present, and all of them make any sense at all. Uh, so just shove them all into Redis. Here's my mode, topic, callback, the IPNS path, the lease, and maybe the secret. That's it. And then uh, the only thing I have to do is to find out whether or not pushing into Redis worked. And if it did not, then that's 500. And if it did, then 202 is what the spec says we return if we enqueued the request. Because we haven't actually promised that your subscription or unsubscription has worked at this point, because that would require me to do verification logic in the web front end, which would be a giant DDoS hole. Uh, so uh, we just show it in the Redis. Um, if Redis is down, then you can't subscribe to TikTok now. Oh well. So that's the whole web front end. Um, let me show you one tiny thing in here, because it's going to be helpful in all of the other pieces. Wait for threads. This is super fun. This is, one of my, this is one of the first concurrency things I've ever built that didn't use a queue. Um, so that's why I like it, because I have always been like, why would I use things that aren't a queue? But then this isn't a queue. It's so fun. Uh, so basically, I just have a transactional variable with a number in it, and I just ask the variable, well, what is number in there? And then if the number is bigger than zero, uh, block <laughs> until the number is exactly zero. So it's like the world's most boring semaphore, where like it's only, like you can do any, you can set the number to anything you want, you can add to it, subtract from it, I don't care. All I care about is, is it above zero or not? Uh, the reason for this is that uh, I have, it, it makes it so that I can write all the rest of my code, uh, so that I just fork threads and throw them away constantly because threads in Haskell are basically free. Um, but that doesn't mean that I, just because I can spawn as many threads as I want, doesn't mean I want to because that's another um, uh, DOS hole, right? People could just take up all the RAM on my box by making me spawn an infinite number of threads. So I want to have a limit. So basically, every place that I spawn a thread, I run this thing to be like, if there are too many threads, then don't do anything right now because we don't want to spawn to it. So basically all this is for, it's just for limiting the concurrency. So we'll see how, see how that's used in here. Um, so this is the thing that take, that reads off the queue that the web front end pushes into. Um, I'll pass up my line buffering, obviously. Connect to Redis again. Do some stuff. Logger, all that good stuff. So this is like the Redis, um, the simplest Redis queuing pattern for a, a worker. Um, in this case, I'm making some simplifying uh, assumptions that this is the only copy of the worker that will ever run. Um, that if I'm only, this line is the line on which I make that assumption. So basically, I say, hey, if I crashed or something in the middle of doing work, then there will be stuff in this list that was in progress. I will just do all of that now. And the only way that that's safe is because I assume that I'm the only one doing anything, because uh, I handle all my concurrency with threads in this process instead of by having multiple workers. Uh, if I have multiple workers, everything else would work, but I'd have to figure out another way to do resume. There'd have to be some kind of process for deciding who gets to do the resume. So yeah, so I just take everything out of the in-progress list, 
uh, and I pass it all to my start helper, and then wait. So that's my wait there. I just like shove it all in, and I wait for them all to be done, just so we're at zero. And then forever, use propeller push to put stuff into my in progress and get it back, and then run the verify on that. Right. So start verify is going to spawn a new thread for every single thing that comes through. Um, but uh, and, anyway, yeah. So that, 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 start verify is basically just like take all that stuff I just pushed into Redis, pop it back out, uh, print a bunch of stuff. Here's my concurrency up one. So that's where I just like to say one more thread is running now, right before I fork. Right here, fork. Um, and then inside the thread I'm going to subtract, and then that's how I wait for the threads to do the concurrency thing. Basically, I'm just bookkeeping how many threads are running, which is why I didn't go for a full queue here. Like, I could have had a server that knew how many threads were running and managed that, and it would be like this, the thread manager. I could have done it with queues, but it seemed like pretty heavy overkill to essentially just keep a count. And if I'm wrong, like, it doesn't it'll like a a little bit, it mostly doesn't matter as long as it always eventually reaches zero. Um, you know, my number of threads will be slightly too high or something. The only thing that matters is that somehow in this case it never reach zero, so that would be bad obviously because it would take forever, but that would be exactly the same case with the server because everyone would just be waiting on the server to tell them to keep going, so it's not really different in my mind, I thought. Um, so yeah, this just completes the pattern where I fork the, the thread, I call either subscribe or unsubscribe based on the mode, and then uh, when it's done, I remove it from the in-progress list so that it won't get tried again when we restart. Oh, there's one subscribe one right there. This one is it that way. Uh, yeah, so these are all like, this one is, is all really verifying again, right? You just take the thing, uh, here I'm calling uh, I can ask resolve, so that's the CD URL here that I build. I'm just calling the API and the local IPFS IPF statement to say, here's the thing that I got, resolve this. Uh, and if it can resolve it, then hooray, your thing made sense. I, I made up a string based on what you gave me and that made sense, so you're all good. And then I send you back the verify. But if it doesn't resolve, then I have no idea what this thing is. I'm never going to be able to pull for it, so I send you back a compare. Um, I do that here with the deny callback. So I basically either deny here or I do verify with subscriber. So that's the only, so verify with subscriber uh, is just like doing an exchange thing where I take, um, I make up a challenge, which is just like random bytes, I literally get random bytes 50 in my case. Uh, I just get 50 random bytes and I make a request saying, hey, did you want to subscribe to this? Here are 50 random bytes. And if they print the same 50 random bytes back to me, then I know that they intended to subscribe to this, and I return yes, and then we tell Redis to save everything. Otherwise, no, don't do that. So that's right here, 404 means no. Anything, 200 means yes, if the challenge matches. Everything else means no for now. Everything else technically means error, but I'm, I just count this no. I don't know. It's a, this, this, there's a couple of different things you're allowed to do in this case, but I just choose to be like, didn't work. There you go. Um, yeah, and then when I come back, I just put it into Redis. So this, I'm using, for I'm using the set? I think so. Um, yeah, so, I'm using a Redis set to store all the callbacks because of the expiry. Um, because while Redis lets you expire individual keys, it doesn't let you set expiry times on stuff inside the list because that would be too helpful. I mean, also, to be fair, it would be a ridiculous thing for them to implement. It would be kind of complicated. But it is a, it is a limitation that Redis has. So what I do is I use a, a sorted set where the score of the element is like when it expires, um, and then uh, at another point in the code, I can just constantly 
delete everything out of the set whose score is less than now, and then all the old stuff just goes away. Uh, that's how I do my database cleaning, which is pretty fine for this case. Uh, so yeah, so I just put all those state interrogates here, and then we're good. Oh yeah, I have this last resolved to idea, which tells it what the hash was, because the core premise here is that I, everything in IPNS you know, ends up resolving to an IPNS hash. So I've got a hash that represents the full address of all the content. So if the hash changes, then the content is changed, and then I can just fetch the differences. Um, which is even a helpful thing for, I can say, between these two, I can ask the daemon, between these two hashes, what paths changed, then I know exactly what paths to update for, and everything. So, um, that's in here. So those two are like the whole subscribe workflow, verified everything, and then this one just assumes that there's a Redis with data that those things are populated. It doesn't actually talk to them at all, really. It just looks at this, these sets in Redis. Um, so it's a very similar pattern. I just do this thing uh, where I scan over um, all of the sets. Um, I use this uh, scan thing that uh, Redis has that lets me like basically page through the stuff in case there's a lot of it, so that I'm not blocking up the server and making a huge list for me. Um, so I've got it all in a Redis cache, to, and I just like loop over everything in there, get the thing it was last resolved to, uh, and then I just have to resolve it again. Uh, here is my resolve, that's the same URL from before. I'm just resolving again, and then I just say, okay, is last path equal to current path? Did the hash change? The hash did not change, they are equal. I am done, there is nothing to do, right? Um, Otherwise, uh, then I go and I call the diff API, which, like I said, it just tells me what paths changed. It doesn't do like binary level dipping on the objects or anything crazy. It just tells me like which paths in this directory changed in this across these two hashes. And that lets me know what I actually have to look at. So then once I know what paths changed, I get the diff out. Um, and I just loop over all of path, well, Oh yeah, I loop over all the paths that changed here, so that's my four over the diff. I uh, get the path and whether or not it was deleted. Uh, if it was deleted, I don't care. I'm not gonna notify you about something being deleted. So if it was deleted, then I consider that no change for our purposes. So it's supposed to be updating, people tell people about updates, and delete is not really an update. It doesn't really fit the website model to tell you that the RSS feed has been deleted. Or that it be. Uh, so I just ignore that case. Uh, but if it's not deleted, then I just go through and I look in those sets. Uh, oh yeah, here's where I remove things. So everything from infinity until now, I delete. I just kind of just purge old stuff out. Um, and then I get everything out of the set uh, that matches the full path. So that's the hash plus whatever path, subpath change. I get all that out, get all the callbacks out, and I shove that into another queue. Um, basically just to make this code simpler. Like I could have bundled all of this into one process and used more threads, but I just, I was already using Redis queues for everything every way. I just made it feel simpler, and then I could, in theory, expand it out to multiple workers and multiple boxes or whatever if I wanted to. I don't want to, but why not? Made everything easier. So yeah. So once I have, once I know, okay, this path definitely changed. Uh, and these are the people who want to know when that path changes, then I just basically take that pair of thing that changed, the person who wants to know, and I push it into another register. And that's my whole job. So this, this thing just pulls really quick. It's not even a long running process. It exits when it's done. Um, so that I can just call it in cron. And then it just pulls DNS basically, checks if the hash has changed, and if it has changed, asks what subpath has changed, pushes that into register. That's the whole thing. Um, and then the last bit uh, here is the send things. So this is the same pattern we saw in the last workers where I'm looping, looping over first my leftovers and then going to my uh, actual queue. <clears throat> oh, this is things to retry. I, I actually have three things here. I have, I have leftovers. I have stuff that was, I was in the middle of, stuff I have to do, but there's also retries. 
So I have another uh, score set where the score is when to retry. Uh, because if I try and send a ping to someone and their website is down, what do I, I can't just not tell them. Uh, I have to wait till they're back up. So I just put it in with like back off and retry again later. Easy peasy stuff. Um, I'm going to wait for threads all in here. Right. So I just go over each of these possible pings from either the queue or the retries and spawn up a thread to do the ping. And the ping itself is fairly simple, although there's a bit of a weird thing I have to do here with this limited stream force. So this is one of the interesting things that I ran into with this spec, um, is that the spec allows, for reasons that I no longer understand, um, you to specify a secret when you create the subscription, and then when the hub tells you about the new content, it will hash all of the content it's about to send you with your secret, and then it'll send that hash ahead. And the idea is that way you know that this request is actually coming from the hub that you made the subscription from. That's the idea. So people can't just hit your callback endpoint uh, with bogus updates. You know this is an update you're actually intended to get. Makes perfect sense. Uh, the problem is that it, you could just have made your callback an obscure long URL with garbage in it yourself, and then you would know that anyone who hits it has the secret URL that you gave them for the callback. I don't really understand why you need it to be in a hashed header um, unless you don't have TLS, which seems ridiculous at this point. I guess TLS was like not quite as universal when PubSubMail started. But especially by the time they got to like renaming it web sub and moving it into the W3C, I feel like this kind of historical thing would have dropped off. But it has not, and in practice, a lot of subscribers still send secrets. Um, so the problem I had was I wanted to do everything in a streaming fashion, which is built here, where I make a request for the object, and I make the request to send you the object, and then I just link the two uh, network streams together, and the bytes just flow from one network socket to the other network socket across, right? Because I don't want to have to slurp the whole object into memory because it might be like a six gigabyte movie file. I don't want to have to store that in memory just to send it to you. The problem is that in order to hash it, I have basically two choices. I can either request it and then in a streaming fashion do the hash and then make a second network request and do the stream across with that and tack the hash on. That would work. Or I can make one request put it in the memory, hash the in-memory thing, and send it the in-memory thing. Those are basically my two choices. It's a hard choice in this case, because making the request twice is pretty cheap, because it's assumedly going to a local IPFS daemon that has all the data cached already. Like, it should be fine. So I could have done it that way, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. So instead, what I do is I only do the streaming mode if there's no secret. And if there is a secret, I put it in memory, but then I have to have uh, a limit on number of bytes, otherwise bad things could happen. So if it goes over that, if you have a secret and the thing you're subscribed to goes over this many bytes, then I just don't ever send you updates. And you won't know. Uh, I don't really have a yeah. Basically, my alternative is to do two requests. Uh, yeah. Most people are requesting atom feeds or RSS feeds, which are usually like less than a kilobyte anyway. So this is not a real problem for most current practice, uh, and hopefully if people start using it for more advanced things, they will just stop using secrets because they're dumb. That's basically my actual plan, uh, which is why I didn't bother to get more fancy this, but that's, yeah. So this is like the gross thing I had to do in this whole project. This is real bad. So in here I just do all my folds to get the HMAC and stuff, and do the signature, and I build up my request, and I, oh, I do some fun things where I send, like, the dweb link um, as a header so that the person receiving it also gets the new IPFS hash if they happen to know what that is. If they're like a legacy subscriber that doesn't actually know about me, then they'll just ignore this header. Um, it's great. Well, the other thing that's fun in here is that I, the spec requires uh, that I set a content type when I send stuff to you so that you know what kind of content you're getting. Which seems a little weird, because you asked for this in the first place, so you should know what it is, but fine. 
Um, it also strictly requires that the content type I send you be the same content type that you would get if you fetched this URL yourself. Because the idea is that I'm just notifying you of something you could have pulled for and it should feel almost identical to you. It's not an unreasonable thing to want. The problem is that IPFS doesn't support my types yet. Um, and I, I say yet in a hopeful way because there's some debate as to whether or not that will ever be properly supported. So what they do right now is they just use Go's like auto infer mime type thing to generate their content type header. Um, which sometimes guesses wrong, but that's not a big problem. The biggest problem is that sometimes guesses different than your web server will guess. Uh, and so if you're serving this file through a web server that isn't the IPFS daemon, um, for which is where the web sub picks it up from, then my content type that I send you will be different than that content type. I can't imagine this being a big problem in practice, um, unless they're like, unless it's just like so wrong that nothing will happen. But I don't know. Um, yeah, it is technically a deviation from the spec that I have to live with. It, it makes me fail the validator uh, when I test against like NeoCities because NeoCities does this in practice. They serve through Apache instead of through IPFS when you go over the web. But then when I pull, I get it over IPFS and I get a different <coughs> content type. So on one side I get text XML and on the other side I get application XML or something like this because they just guess it's because those are basically the same anyway and they just choose a different one. Um, yeah, so like I said, I can't imagine a subscriber where that's really a problem, but it is, in theory, technically possible to be a problem. Uh, yeah, so put the signature in if there is one, and then stuff. Um, if they delete, if they send me a 410, that means that they don't want this stuff anymore, so I can delete the subscription early. Um, but I don't currently do that. Uh, currently, I have the code that knows that this is a subscription deleted, but what I do with that is consider it success. I successfully delivered the message. And they told me they didn't want it, but I don't care. Because <laughs> I didn't build any special handling for that. And then if, it, if I return false here, then that's going to dump me into my error set for back off retries, which is somewhere very close here.
atomically, so you have to transact and do fun stuff like that. Yeah, that's most of it. Those are the four things, they all communicate through the Redis thing. Do stuff. Questions? People who are like, I understood none of those words. <laughs> you understood none of those words. The time to speak was like 10 minutes ago, but now is also time. So this is built on blockchain? <coughs> it's for blockchain? No, it's not just for this. No. Just HTTP and IPFS. That's all. And credits. Yeah. Just wondering, how long did it take you to build? How long did it take me to build? I have a six-month-old daughter. Uh, so my work is done in 17-minute increments. It's very hard to measure. Uh, weeks, but like, not really. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, if I was doing it solid, it probably took me like a day, maybe a day and a half. Okay, so the idea is that, uh, so the reason I built it, I should have started with my motivating example. That's a great <laughs> place to start, instead of my general example. So my motivating example is that I'm porting my entire website into IPFS, and I want people to still be able to subscribe to it using Mastodon. Um, so if you put my website into Mastodon, then it's going to try and set up a web sub connection because that's how everything works in order to get up pinged about updates when I post new posts. Um, and currently that's being handled because I have a WordPress plugin that like knows when I make a new post and then does all the pings for me to the hub. Um, but with this, instead of any of that, I'm just going to like publish a new version of the site into IPFS and then the polling daemon will just know that it's changed and make all the, tell all the Mastodon instances that I've posted a thing automatically without me having to have plugins that know anything about how my content is formatted. So that means I can use any static site generator I want and switch, I can just type new HTML files by hand and push them, whatever I want. And as long as this thing is running, it'll see, aha, this file has changed and then it'll push the content out and everything will just work without having any specifically tied content. So instead of writing a plugin for my static site generator that pinged a hub, I built a thing that would just always know if my site changes ever. Uh, and that way it'll be generic. Generic forever as long as I'm still on IPFS. Yeah. yeah, what's Mastodon do? What do you mean? What Tell me mean? about it. Mastodon? Okay. <laughs> Mastodon. There, see, it's the elephant in space. <laughs> <laughs> It's this, it's, I don't know, it's just, it's one of, it, it's, the only reason I even mentioned it, I don't even like it, uh, it's because it's the most popular one, it's just one of the, like, one of these things, post tiny bits of text really fast, lots of it, so much, oh no, so many people on not social these days, look at all the shit they're saying, hello, how are you, who posts hello, how are you on their Twitter, what? I'm sorry. I don't know. People tweet some weird things. Who tweets hello, how are you? Who is supposed to answer that? Me. I should go just reply to that guy right now and be like, ah, what? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, please pass it on. So, um, so any user can subscribe to any other user on any compatible piece of software. So, uh, with my hub running, every single web page that has an associated Atom feed in IPFS automatically becomes Mastodon compatible and also can do social compatible and frantic compatible and everybody. Um, so, uh, so there's this other thing called NeoCities. This is like a bad example because NeoCities, uh, their IPFS publisher is a bit slow right now. Uh, these guys are great. Uh, you like come in here and you make a terrible website. We can always find out the terrible websites. Um, so if you made a terrible website on NeoCities, they do put everything in IPFS automatically. So if you put an Atom feed on your NeoCities site, then it would just magically be subscribable by any Mastodon user. Um, it would just be really slow because they take like a day or two to put their stuff in IPFS so the updates would be really slow, which is not really what you want for your tweets. But 
Um, they'll probably make it faster. It's still experimental as far as Neo City is concerned. I mean, realistically, all of Neo City is experimental. It's a giant experiment in making more people make terrible websites, which is great. Terrible websites are the best kind of websites. Can I answer your question? Sort of? Good enough, yeah. Okay. Other people? Anybody? You don't have to have a question. <laughs> 